Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hill. It's a short video for our class, Introduction to Ethics, Philosophy 2306 here at St. Philip's College for the summer one term of 2021. Today is Saturday, the 12th of June, 2021, and we are in the first week of our philosophy class, our ethics course, and we have our first assignment due tomorrow night, Sunday, uh, by midnight. So today, I hope everybody is reading their textbooks, writing their essay, and getting ready to drop it into the discussion uh, by tomorrow night. Uh, some folks have already done this, and um, they're already looking pretty good. So uh, we seem to be a little bit ahead of the game, which is always a good sign. But just make sure that the first thing you do when you go to the website, a Canvas page, to the discussion, is to drop in your essay. You got to do that first and then look around, read some of the other ones, comment on at least two. So I said uh, yesterday that um, I had been talking about the case study about Jenny Lake compared to Cassandra Callender, um, talked about decision making. And one of the things that I asked you to do, in fact, a couple of students said, you know, what, what specifically do you want me to, to comment on? In the essay, and I said, look, I said, right out of the first chapter, the definition of ethics is the philosophical study of morality. So we're going to be studying it, talking about it, looking at different aspects of it. And morality is our beliefs about good and bad, right and wrong. Now, one of the things that I said yesterday was, hey, that varies from, you know, place to place. And so, and then I said, please go look at the module. In there, there's some information. It'll take you to this pew. There's links. It'll take you to the pew charitable trust where they have this really great um, survey that they did. They did it in 2014. As you can see here, they talked to 40,000 people in 40 different countries to get, first of all, kind of a global perspective on these eight key ethical issues. And then you can also break it down by a country. And so we're gonna actually look at the, we're gonna start with kind of what the big picture and then compare and contrast countries. The point being that you're gonna see some real differences from different countries, different societies, different cultures that have very fundamentally different values. And so this was the survey. And again, what they're doing here is the Pew folks are just taking a snapshot of the way things are. They don't advocate for positions. They don't say one's right or one's wrong. They just say, this is what people believe. And the way they do this is they, they talk about these eight key issues and they just ask you pretty simply, is it morally acceptable? Is it morally unacceptable? Or is it somehow not even a moral issue? So uh, let's take a look at this. And if we go here. This is the, uh, the results of the 40,117 people who were asked about these issues. And you can see them going right down the line there, which is extramarital affairs, gambling, homosexuality, abortion, premarital sex, alcohol consumption, divorce, and the use of contraception. So they wanted to ask people, is this unacceptable? So, for example, if you look here, the top line, extramarital affairs, that's the one thing that most people around the world agreed is morally unacceptable. It's wrong. This is something you should not do. Now, again, it's not a survey of how many people are having affairs, because there's lots of people that have, or, that have affairs but think it's wrong. That's why they hide it. That's why they lie about it. Um, so it's just the question of, is it right or wrong? Not, am I currently violating this or somehow? So, uh, and what you see there is the big orange bar says it's unacceptable. The little green piece are the people that say, yeah, sure, that's acceptable. It's okay to have an affair, to cheat on your spouse. And there's even a small percent there that say it's somehow not a moral issue. Um, so, that's the, the survey, and that's how they approach these issues. And if you look, they're kind of in order from the views of people that say it's, it's largely unacceptable. 
and then kind of you get down to and see you can see gambling and homosexuality there's more people that say homosexuality is morally unacceptable than say gambling but there's also more people that say it's acceptable than there is for gambling that's why they're ordered like that you end up with a bigger piece that say gambling is somehow not a moral issue so that's what accounts for that but as you move down you see fewer and fewer people object or find morally unacceptable like alcohol use or divorce or finally contraception use you see the big green bar there which says lots of people say it's morally acceptable um the, that question even strikes a lot of my students as being kind of weird like why is that even on here and i'm like well it's because it used to be considered by a lot of people to be morally unacceptable in fact in this country when my grandparents were born it was against the law it was illegal to buy sell possess contraception so it's it's changed a lot <laughs> and uh we're going to talk about that um but let's do a little compare and contrast first so the next thing we want to get to is you can pull out individual specify individual countries and again i highly recommend the website they have this interactive information it's loads of fun to kind of get in there and play around with and and see the different ways you can compare a country like germany for example which is a developed rich western european country with kind of traditional christian roots and what you see is that for example 60 percent of the people say that extramarital affairs are wrong now that's down from the global average in fact there's a lot more people here that say it's not a moral issue uh 26 percent than the global scale but you'll also see that 31 percent almost a third of the people think that gambling is morally unacceptable but then when you look at these other issues, homosexuality, only 8% think that's unacceptable. A big percent of the population, over half, say that's just, it's morally acceptable. It's perfectly fine. Uh, again, small numbers for premarital sex, divorce, contraception, 1%. So it's 70% it's of the people in Germany say, listen, it's perfectly fine. Contraception is, is completely morally acceptable uh and so what we're going to say is this is a snapshot of germany this again this was taken in 2014 um but it's kind of an indication of where the society the cultural values are on these eight moral issues well look at the difference between germany and like a country like tunisia that's a big jump suddenly that's a lot of the orange so germany Tunisia, Germany, Tunisia. And look, here's a country which is a developing Middle Eastern country, a traditionally um, Islamic country, and again, really finds it has a very much more traditional set of values in terms of saying these things are wrong on these issues. Dang. <laughs> Uh, 90% on extramarital affairs, 91% gambling, 92% homosexual. These are people saying this is all morally unacceptable. 89%, nine in 10 people premarital sex. Uh, and alcohol use, again, probably a reflection of uh, the Islamic culture, which really, you know, says that alcohol is not morally acceptable. But even again, high rates for divorce and, and contraception. Uh, and my point is simply here, not that one country's right and one's wrong. We can have that conversation in a little bit. But right now, today's, the, the moral of the story for today is, just look how different they are. And again, in terms of this comparison, look at the next country, France. God love the French. They're the only country in the world that couldn't muster 50% to say that having an extramarital affair was wrong. 47% say it's morally unacceptable to cheat on your spouse, uh, which tells you that marriage there is a lot different than it is in a lot of other places. Um, they have 12% 
that say it's morally acceptable and not a moral issue. Somehow it's just not even, not even in a moral issue is 40% of the people. That's, a, that's surprising to me. But again, of all the countries that they measured, the 40 in the survey, that's the one with the, the lowest number of people saying it, it's morally unacceptable, less than half. Uh, but again, when you look at the other things, you just see a whole lot of not a moral issue and a whole lot of, yeah, sure, it's morally acceptable, it's fine. Um, these numbers below 10% for premarital sex, divorce, contraception, those are really small numbers. And you can see here, again, very little of the orange of people in society when asked saying that these issues are morally unacceptable. And again, just to kind of drill home the point of the day, let's compare France to a country like Uganda. You go to Uganda and here are lots of people saying that these issues are really morally unacceptable. Again, there's lots of different reasons why. The, the, the point is that the culture, the society as a whole, has a certain set of values that are impacted by lots of things, by economics, by religious values and beliefs. There's lots of, you know, colonial history. There's lots of things that impact why the people in a particular society believe the things they do. But Again, the PE research folks aren't going into the why. They're just saying, this is what it is. From chapter one, this, this is the, the normative ethics. This is the norm, the standard. This is the scientific snapshot of this information about the way things are and what people believe. And again, you look at, you know, you do the comparison. Here's Uganda and then France. Uganda. France. That's just a huge difference. Um, and so it makes the point that it does matter. It makes a huge difference where you are in the world because different societies have developed differently. They've evolved differently. Their values and beliefs are fundamentally different. And we have lots of countries, lots of societies around the world, and they have, listen, they have different languages. They have different values and beliefs, they have different religions, and all of these things end up kind of coming together to shape the character, the values, the norm of that particular society. Um, so I encourage you to go in and look country by country, and they also like, they line it up to where you can see by issue as well. So these are the country profiles. Um, I'm going to shrink this picture so you can see this better. Um, but again, this is like extramarital affairs ranked in order of finding it morally unacceptable. So France is at the top because they have the fewest people that say less than half that say it's morally unacceptable. And again, you can see all the way down uh, this cutoff. This isn't all 40, but you get down to the United States for comparison purposes. Because what happens is you go from the French who are under 50 percent, the next country, Germany is 60, and then you get 70s, 80s, um, all the rest of it fall in behind them. So you can, my point here is just simply that you can look at this by issue as well. And so like on alcohol use, and again, this is it's fascinating to see how the countries group together. So this is on the issue of alcohol use. And again, the orange is the society saying it's morally unacceptable. So you look at Pakistan, and they, they have 94% of the people say it's more than acceptable. Not a lot of alcohol sales in Pakistan. This is a dry country because, again, this is just a societal value. And when you look here, uh, you can see it, it's interesting. You, there's a temptation to group these things together, mostly by here. Say, well, it's the Muslim faith. It's, it's, it's Islam is the big factor linking together Pakistan, Palestine, Indonesia, Jordan, Tunisia, Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana. Th those countries all have in common um, a background, a predominant norm 
in terms of being influenced by Islam. But is that the one thing, the one thread you can pull out and attribute that to? Probably not. It's not as simple as to just say, well, you know, these countries are Christian, so they're all going to group together on this issue because it just, it varies. There's so many factors that it, it's difficult to say anything other than there's a whole lot of things which influence why a country ends up in this category. But if you look at the next, this is the flip side of this, or essentially the bottom of that list. So this is the, the countries that say that drinking alcohol is morally acceptable. So Japan uh, has a very high rate of that, lots of green there. See that 66%. And again, they just have a, a, a culture which has traditionally valued drinking alcoholic beverages as part of family ceremonies, as part of religious ceremonies. It's just part of daily life there in a way which is very, very different than a country like Pakistan. So, uh, and again, you get to the United States, you see uh, down it goes Venezuela, South Korea, Philippines, United States coming in at 32%. But again, there for the United States, 46%, so almost half. So it's just not even a moral issue. Drinking alcohol isn't a moral issue, which is striking for a country that passed a constitutional amendment banning the sale of alcohol during prohibition. And then later it was so wildly unpopular that they had passed another constitutional amendment to change the, the first one and make sure that it was legal again. Now, there's still vestiges of this. Here in Texas, we still have some dry counties. So you could have a wet county next to a dry county. And that's a reflection of this tension about people's values and beliefs towards alcohol and its use. Listen, here in San Antonio, we still have restrictions on when you can sell it. Um, you know, good grief. I was in a, a store the other day. It was, it was like a QT ga gas station in the morning. And this guy, I, he sees I'm wearing a watch, which a lot of people don't wear watches anymore because they check their time on their phones. But this guy comes up to me in the store and he says, could you tell me what time it is? And I said, yeah, sure. It's like 10 minutes to seven in the morning. He goes, oh, so not 7 a.m. yet. And I'm like, no. And then I realized, oh, he's asking because they can't sell beer yet. That was the problem for this guy. Uh, and again, these are, those are laws, blue laws are called, that reflect our statewide values about alcohol and alcohol use. Um, and the last column here is just the ones that say, hey, this is not even a moral issue. So when you rank them by not a moral issue, the gray, you get Canada. And you think Canada, France, Italy, Greece, Britain, Spain, United States, Australia, Germany. All of a sudden, again, you might think you're grouping them together as, if not European, Western, Europe, Western civilization. So like British and its colonies, like Australia, United States, and Canada. But so you do have, there are some links there, but then the question becomes, are those the links that explain why they're all grouped together here? So we've got to be careful about attributing characteristics to these results. Um, we need more data about that. Again, they're just saying, this is the way it is. So when we look at this, um, when we start talking about what's morally acceptable or not, it does dramatically depend on where you are in the world. So we'll have to, to come back to that and talk some more about that survey, that issue. We'll come back to this later. But I just want to make the point up front that one of the things we have to remember is this significant difference from society to society, culture to culture, about morality. So um, I do want to mention one other thing briefly here, which is, yeah, this. We were talking about these eight issues, and, um, and one of which was homosexuality. I mentioned this one because um, some of these issues, they're not just different country to country, but within a single country, 
they can change dramatically. I mentioned a minute ago prohibition and our attitudes about alcohol use and making it completely illegal in the whole country to then throwing that out and saying, no, no, it's okay. We're going to go back from dry to wet. We went from wet to dry to wet in a very short period of time. So these things can evolve quickly. One of which is a good example. This is the Pew Research about same-sex marriage among adults in Texas. So this is adults in Texas, their views on same-sex marriage from the same year as the previous study, 2014. And one of the things you see here is that it was kind of evenly split between 46% and 46%, um, which in 2014, you got to remember, people were, and the, the history of this is that in the last 25 years, this issue has evolved dramatically. And so when you look at things like this, is these are the views broken down by religious groups, trying to get a sense, again, like, is it the religion that is explaining what people's values and beliefs are? Because we know that religion is plays a big part in people's formation of their morality, their beliefs about good and bad, right and wrong. So that people want to know, but it's, again, you gotta be careful about drawing straight lines. But here, when you look at Catholics, a little over half were saying that they were strongly in favor or favored, as opposed to, you can see the gray there, uh, the opposed or strongly opposed, 37%. So, that's very different than when you get to evangelical Protestants or even historically black Protestants. That's, it's much more in line with the mainline Protestants, 52, 53%. But when you look at the unaffiliates, the nuns, these are the people that say they might have a sense of spirituality, they might believe in God, but they're not aligned with an institution like the Roman Catholic Church or some mainline Protestant group. Um, those folks were strongly in favor. So there seemed to be much more support upon people who were not affiliated than there were people who were kind of the church growing, you know, crowds that are in the pews on Sunday morning. And one last thing about this too, because I, I want to come back to how dramatically it's changed in 25 years. But the last thing is, this is very interesting. This was the broken down by age. And, um, and when you look at, the people that again are in favor of same-sex marriage, they don't think it's, they wouldn't be have a problem with homosexuality. They say people that are 18 to 29 are twice as likely. Look at that. Then the next group, which is the this is the 30 to 49 and 50 to 64, and then over 65. So what happens is when you look at the first bar, these are the people that are strongly in favor but they're, they're weighted with a strongly, they're weighted with the people that are, the people that are saying they're in favor of same-sex marriage are young in this group. The, the biggest group is 38%, the 30 to 49. But when you look at the 18 to 49, so the under 50 adults, that's, that's a big group. When you go down to oppose it, then all of a sudden, you see it, 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 the age there is the big factor. In fact, when I looked at this, interestingly enough, um, it didn't break down in terms of oppose or agree in favor or against. It didn't break down on economics. Um, it didn't break down by race. The, the, the biggest thing that it broke down on is age. And the demographic, the people that are out there collecting the data, the scientists, the people that work for Pew Charitable Trust, they'll tell you when you see a chart like this, it tells you the direction of that particular issue. Because if the old people are opposed to it and the young people are in favor of it or don't care, then that means it's shifting quickly as old people die and there are more and more young people around. That just means there's a tide which over time that issue is going to go their way. Um, it's happening now with marijuana use. 
that's another one where it's not about economics. It's not about race. It's just about age. Old people oppose it. Young people either don't care or want it, which is why all across the country, you're seeing more and more laws which uh, are in favor of legalizing marijuana for recreational use. Um, whether you think it's good or bad, I'm just telling you, that's a tidal wave that's rolling across the country. So if you think it's bad, you got to do more to stop it. If you don't care or you're in favor of it, then, you know, it'll get to Texas soon enough. Believe me, it's it's coming. Um, now, but this is an interesting one. I, I wanted to pull this out of the eight key issues we saw because it's um, it's an important issue. And it also shows how the biggest thing is it shows how fast this can change, you know. In the 90s, in the Clinton administration, they were beginning to switch from homosexuals not being allowed to serve in the military to some kind of don't ask, don't tell policy where it was going to be, you know, tolerated if you just didn't say you were homosexual. Uh, they weren't going to ask. But then it finally flips to being permissible. Because the laws in the states had also changed from homosexual activity, again, consulting conduct between adults, homosexual activity was illegal, but then they changed it and said, it's not illegal anymore, it's, it's legal, it's permissible. And then finally started the, the movement, the gay rights movement was focused on marriage and switched it from First of all, there was this process of kind of civil unions where there was this effort to say, well, it's like marriage, but not marriage. It's, it's, it might have even all the same rights as a married couple, but just don't call it marriage because that somehow was really the big hook to finally it became legal. Same-sex marriage now is legal in all 50 states. And, uh, and again, it's, it's fading quickly into the distance from a moral perspective, because the people that were opposed to it died, younger people that didn't care or were in favor of it got into positions of power and changed the laws. And now people look back and they think about it like prohibition, like, oh my God, that happened a long time ago. Um, it wasn't that long ago, but, but the point is that it changed rapidly. I mean, within 25 years, it, it went from being banned in the military and illegal to permissible, tolerated, to completely allowed in the military and now full marriage, full same-sex marriage rights. So that, that issue shifted and boy, when it did, it shifted fast. So it can happen in a single kind. So it's not just differences from country to country that we're talking about or looking at. It's also within a particular country that you can have dramatic changes in the fundamental important values and beliefs of a society. We've got to keep that in mind because when you look out the window, there's dramatic change out there. And so you, you, know, you, you, you have to take into account the fact that it's so different place to place and even in a single society or culture, it can change dramatically and quickly over time. So that's the lesson of the day. The links are in the, um, uh, the modules. I'd encourage you to take a look at them. And I encourage you to think about this as we apply this to the case studies. I know tomorrow night, Sunday, the 13th is the Jenny Lake case. Um, but I wanted to go over this now because one of the questions for, you know, the Jenny Lake case, the two questions are pretty simple, which is, you know, she made this choice. Do you agree or disagree? Do you think what she did was right or wrong? And then why? Well, the why question, you know, it's just why, question mark. Well, when you start getting into why you believe what you do, you got to think about where did that come from in me? Are my values and beliefs directly inherited from my family? Is this something that I went and sought out and sorted out on my own after reading and contemplation and thinking or prayer or study? Where did my values come from? For a whole lot of people, it's like two big bags of luggage, like suitcases. And they just kind of get handed them, you know, as a kid. They're like, here's the family's values and beliefs. Take them. And you go, okay. 
And then as you start to get a little older, you know, high school, college, young adulthood, this kind of stuff, people are like, well, hold on a minute. Do I want to keep these bags? Uh, and some people it's like, yes, these are terribly important to me. These are my history, family values, my identity. It's really important to me. And some people go, nope. <laughs> and, and again, start all over. Most people probably open up the suitcases. They think about it. They take some stuff out, <laughs> leave most of it, you know, uh, <laughs> it's it's a process and so we got to talk about how we sort that out for ourselves if we're trying to answer this question of why in our essay for tomorrow so that is a not, i said at the beginning a short video i lied this was a long video for our class introduction to ethics philosophy 2306 however uh i'm glad you had a chance to to join me and to watch the video and to uh, hopefully think about some of these issues over the weekend. Good luck reading and writing your essays. Don't forget to copy and paste them, drop them into the discussion. All right, take care of yourselves. Take care, bye-bye.